I recently gave a presentation virtually to the San Fernando Valley Amateur Radio Club, W6SD, in California. And the talk was really a combination of my introduction to Smith charts, as well as using the nano VNA to characterize antennas, and kind of combining those two topics together. So sit back and enjoy the presentation. So we're going to talk a bit about uh, the basics. Uh, I want to give everybody a basic understanding of what the Smith chart is, because it actually can be quite useful. Uh, not only to look at what your antenna looks like and making the measurements with it, but uh, if you're ambitious enough to go, you know, design a matching network, um, this can actually help you do that if you enjoy uh, kind of, you know, building things, that, that, that type of a thing. It's also uh, pretty helpful even if you're using a manual antenna tuner to watch what's going on on the Smith chart, and we'll actually see that here as well. So let's get rolling. So the first question is, you know, what is a Smith chart? And it really is a graphical tool that allows you to plot and compute a number of different things. Uh, first and foremost, it allows you to plot complex impedance, okay, meaning the real or resistive component as well as the inductive or capacitive component of an impedance. And any non-resonant you know, type of uh, device, including an antenna and the coax and things like that, typically presents a, a complex impedance to, uh, to our transmitter. And that's what we can actually go look at and look at versus frequency. I could also look at complex reflection coefficient and that, that arises from that, that complex impedance not being matched to the transmission line and that creates a reflection. And that reflection has got a magnitude and a phase, which is why we call it a complex reflection coefficient. Uh, we're probably most familiar with the SWR or VSWR. Uh, we can, can actually read that off of a Smith chart as well. I'll show you how you do that. You can also use the Smith chart, and actually the Smith chart was actually developed to help ease the problem of doing calculations with respect to transmission lines like coax or ladder line or things like that. It was really designed as a transmission line calculator tool uh, originally. So uh, we'll talk about some of the interesting things that happen on a Smith chart with respect to transmission lines. And uh, it also can be used to help you, as I mentioned, design matching networks and really a whole lot more. So we're not gonna go into all of these things in great detail. The whole idea here is just to kind of open your eyes a little bit to you know, what some of the magic of the Smith chart is. Okay, so you understand it a little bit better and maybe uh, dig in a little bit more in those areas that are of interest to you. So let's break it down a little bit, okay? So the first thing we have to talk about before we get into the Smith chart is something called normalized impedance. And what we mean by that is the Smith chart itself isn't really drawn to represent, you know, like a 50 ohm environment, like for 50 ohm coax. It really can be used in any impedance environment. It could be 50 ohms, it could be 600 ohms, could be 75 ohms, et cetera. So the way that we use the Smith chart in these various impedances is to do what's called the normalized impedance, where we take the actual measured impedance or calculated impedance, whatever it might be, and we divide it by our system impedance. Now for, 90% of what we're doing as hams, that system impedance is 50 ohms. So we take our measured impedance, divide by 50, that gives us our normalized impedance. Here, the letter Z represents complex impedance, resistive and reactive component, okay? So again, for a 50 ohm environment, like we're mostly dealing with, we're simply dividing all of those values um, by, uh, by 50. So an example, let's say you're, you had your fancy uh, antenna analyzer and it reported that the antenna's complex impedance was 37 ohms resistive plus an inductive 55 ohms of reactance. So the way we normalize that is we divide each term by 50. Okay, so the normalized impedance represented by the little prime symbol would then be 0 0.74 plus J1.1, okay? So again, by doing this, by normalizing to you know, the system impedance as being in use, it makes the Smith chart usable for any system impedance. Again, but in our case, it's mostly gonna be 50 and that's all we're gonna deal with today. And this value here, this normalized impedance is what we plot on the chart. And that's the way the chart is all drawn. So the Smith chart itself is really just a fancy graph paper that's all curvy instead of straight, okay? And uh, so, and it, it's done that way because it aids in a lot of the uses in terms of predicting SWR and what's going on with transmission line links and things like that. 
So the inventor of the Smith chart, Philip Smith, you know, devised these this gra curved graph paper to help ease some of those computations. But it really is just graph paper, all right? And we'll just use it that way. So if, let's look at the regions on the Smith chart. The horizontal line, you can think of it as the equator, if you will, or the what I will call the prime axis, represents purely resistive uh, impedances, no reactance, okay, Jx equal to zero. So any point that's on that, that middle line, right, uh, across the center is purely resistive. There's no reactive component at all. Now, what's another term for that? Right? Another term for that is resonance, right? Resonance purely means that the impedance does not contain a reactive component, it's purely resistive. So any point along that line is a resonant point. Anything that's above that, this upper hemisphere, if you will, it represents inductive reactance. So if, if the complex impedance, the, if the reactive portion is inductive, then, the, then that is gonna be shown somewhere on the top of the curve, on top of the uh, top half of the Smith chart. And conversely, uh, capacitive reactance is gonna be down below. And this, again, if you're when representing the complex impedance, it's the sign of that, of that J term, okay, determines whether you're inductive or capacitive. So any, anything with a minus J is gonna be down here. Anything with a plus J will be up here, okay? So that's kind of, you know, the big picture of how impedance is represented on the Smith chart, but let's get a little bit more detailed, okay? So where are some key values on the Smith chart? Right smack in the center, right in the bullseye, that represents our, our system impedance. So in our case, that's 50 ohms. On the Smith chart, it's gonna show as 1.0, right? Resistive 1.0 and then J, J0, right? That's right smack there in the center. That's our system impedance. That's 50 ohms, that's where we wanna be. Uh, all the way over here at the three o'clock position, that represents an open circuit, okay? A high impedance, open circuit, um, very high resistance and um, again, no reactants, just an open circuit. So that's represented there at three o'clock. At the other end of that prime axis, as you might guess, represents a short circuit, okay? Zero ohms, okay? Just com a complete dead short. So you could say, well, gee, we go all the way from dead short to 50 ohms here, and then from 50 ohms to infinity up here. And you can kind of see how that's working with these, you know, with the, the lines here too, kind of getting closer and closer together. But that's how things are represented on the Smith chart. And it might also, it makes sense to you that, well, it, it's pretty hard to represent a, a very high impedance, like a 10K ohm or, you know, 20K ohm impedance on a Smith chart, because it's all going to be crowded way, way down in here. So the Smith chart's really kind of usable from a short circuit to 50 ohms up to several hundred ohms or maybe a few K ohms at the very most. And anything beyond that, the Smith chart isn't really that usable anymore, okay? When we're talking about a 50 ohm system. So on the Smith chart, again, there's a bunch of these curves. So what do they all mean? These circles that you see, like you see, I've got this one kind of highlighted in blue and you see a bunch of other ones that they're all tangent at the open circuit point and they just get you know, larger and larger and larger. Those represent constant resistance. The you know the R plus JX. It's the it's the R portion of that that's represented on those circles. The one that cuts right through the center here that represents normalized resistance of one. And there and in our case that's that's 50 ohms. So this would be 50 plus J zero. This would be 50 plus J something. This would be 50 minus J something down here on the curve, right? And then these other circles, like here for example, that's the normalized resistance of 3.0, okay? So that would be 150 ohms right there at that point. Now here's you know, normalized resistance of 0.4. So that would be 20 ohms, right? 0.4 times 50, okay? So that would be that point right there, okay? So they all represent what we call constant resistance. So now, uh, and if we look, if I expand up on this portion of the axis, we can kind of see there's the 1.0 that's sitting running along that circle. Here's the 0 0.4 over here. Okay, that was that, that's where this circle is. Here's the 3.0, right? That's when that one. So it's all these numbers that are kind of here, 2, 1.8, 1.6, 1.4. It's those are the numbers that give you the normalized resistive component represented by that circle. 
So now the, the rest of the curves that are on here are these arcs. You see these arcs going up this way and arcs going down that way. Again, they're all tangent to, or you know, tangent to that open circuit point here. But then each of these arcs, and you can see a couple of different families of them in here, represent different values of either inductive reactants or capacitive reactants. So I've highlighted the plus J1 arc and the minus J1 arc. And the values for those are kind of up here. It's a little bit tough to see, but if you grab a Smith chart, you can look at it. There's a 1.0 here, and that's 0 0.9 and 0 0.8, et cetera. Uh, so like these lines right here, for example, are plus 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5. So you can see as we, we get smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of the inductance, you get to the point where or the, excuse me, the reactants, you get to the point where the reactants goes to zero and you're collapsed out to this straight line that we talked about. And as you go higher and higher in either inductive or capacitive reactants, you start getting onto these tighter and tighter arcs. So then of course, as I mentioned, uh, when the reactance is equal to zero, you're right back to you know, our prime axis uh, going right through the center of the chart. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a picture of where complex impedances lie on the chart. So how do we actually use that? So how would we plot the particular complex impedance? All right. So let's say again that our antenna analyzer gave us a complex impedance of 25 ohms plus an inductive uh, 40 ohm uh, uh, reactance. So the first thing to do is we divide by 50 to normalize it. Okay, and that gives us our normalized impedance of 0.5 plus J.8. So what we do is we find the intersection of the, R, the, the constant resistance 0.5 circle and the constant inductance uh, 0.8 arc. Okay, so here's our 0.5 circle and here's our 0.8 arc. So we look to see where those two intersect and that point right there represents that complex impedance. Okay, that's, that's and so again, it's really, it's, it's just a, a graph paper, and we're applying the intersection of two lines. The lines just happen to be curved instead of rectilinear like we have on normal graph paper. But that's actually how you go and you know, plot a complex impedance. So if we look at this from an antenna standpoint, we, on a nano VNA, it might look like something like this, right? So in this case, if we looked out the bottom, we started at 13.7 megahertz up to 14.7 megahertz. So this is plotting the you know, a little bit wider than the 20 meter band. So I actually see a curve plotted on the Smith chart. The reason for that is because the impedance looking into that, you know, that coax in this case, in, into the antenna, the impedance changes with frequency. And since we plotted over a frequency here, we're seeing a trajectory, if you will, or a curve representing the impedance that it, the, that the antenna system is presenting at different frequencies. So in this case, our complex impedance uh, versus frequency is shown in green, okay? The frequency is only indicated by the markers. That as, on a Smith chart, there's no axis that tells you what frequency you're at. So the only way you really know where you are in frequency is by placing markers on there. Other plots like an SWR plot or something like that, typically it's SWR versus frequency, for example. And I'm actually showing that here. So this white curve down here, okay? You can see that white curve is actually SWR versus frequency. And I've got a marker sitting right down about the minimum SWR. And uh, the marker on, the, on any of the VNAs are gonna track on all the traces. So I can see that my minimum SWR is sitting right where that marker is. It says it's about 14.245 megahertz. And that marker is also in the, at the same frequency on my Smith chart curve. So there's my little marker right there. Now, one thing you'll notice is that my minimum SWR occurs where? At the point on this curve that lies closest to the center of the Smith chart, right? That point lies closest to the center. That's the minimum SWR. So, uh, so there gives you a little bit of the hint that SWR on a Smith chart is proportional to how close you are to the center of the Smith chart. The further you get away, so like the low frequency end of this curve is way down here. That's the same thing as this point on the SWR chart. So my SWR is what, two, three, four, five, six and a half to one, 
at that end right here. We're down to about uh, 1.2 to one right here. And then all the way at the other end over here, where it looks like we're about what, two, three, four, four and a half to one at that end here. Again, the further you are away from the center of the chart on the Smith chart, the higher the SWR. So, um, so how do we actually read that for sure? So on a real Smith chart, which I've got a, a portion of here, the Smith it will also be plotted uh, this set of axes down at the bottom that are called radially scaled parameters. And there's several of them on the bottom of the Smith chart. We're only going to talk about a couple of them here, um, but there's several radially scaled parameters. So, so let's say, for example, at a particular frequency, the complex impedance of my antenna system is sitting right here. Okay, whatever that is. Okay, that's my complex impedance. I'm not quite at the center here. So I've got, I know I'm going to have some measurable SWR, return loss, things like that. So the way we read these radially scaled parameters is we take uh, and rotate, you know, basically draw, you know, use a compass or something like that and take this point and rotate it up equidistant from the center up until we hit the prime axis. Once we hit that prime axis, then we can take and extend that line straight down. And where it crosses these radially scaled parameters, we can read off various things. So for example, that top line is SWR. See, so it says SWR right here. And we can read off that we're seeing about a 2.3 to one SWR. Okay, we could see if we were right at the center, right, if we went straight down, our SWR would be one to one. Those would come along this axis, we're at about 2.3 to one. We also can re read return loss, which is obviously mathematically related to SWR. There's our return loss about 8.1 dB and reflection coefficient for both power and voltage that can be re read there as well. So it's just example of four of the radially scaled parameters that can be read right off of a Smith chart. They're all mathematically related. So things like, like a VNA can calculate them for you, but this is how it's shown on a Smith chart and how we did it before we had DNAs, okay? Well, and that was before my time too. But so, uh, but this also gives you a little bit of a hint of something that if, let's say I had my impedance here mapped out to an SWR of 2.3 to one, but let's say I had an impedance that was right here. If I did the same thing, that would also be 2.3 to one. So this is kind of giving you a little bit of a hint that if I continued this circle all the way around, that tells me that any impedance lying on that line is going to have the same 2.3 to 1 SWR. And that's kind of interesting. And we'll use that a little bit later on here. So again, let's talk about SWR now in transmission lines. Okay, so again, I've got a complex impedance here. And as I mentioned just on the previous slide, if we just draw a circle that crosses that line centered at the center of the chart, what we're saying is that the VSWR and the return loss, the magnitude of the return loss and the SWR are the same for any impedance anywhere along that line. So there's effectively an infinite number of infinite combination of complex impedances that will result in the same SWR. So that's kind of an interesting thing. So as you can imagine, as, the, as that circle were tighter and smaller around the center, that SWR would be smaller. You get to the point where you're right at the center, okay, and, and you, your SWR is one to one. So the larger that circle, again, the further you are away from the center, the higher the SWR is. Okay. So why do we care about that? Well, this interesting thing happens here is that rotate, when you add or subtract transmission line length between your antenna and your transmitter, you're effectively rotating around this curve on the Smith chart. If you add feed line length between your, you know, your antenna, let's say you had you know, 30 feet of coax and you added another 10 feet. As you add that coax, the complex impedance looking into that coax will rotate in a clockwise direction around this constant SWR circle. If we shorten the coax, we rotate the other way. Now, ideally you rotate and stay on this curve. Now, if there's loss in the transmission line, then you wind up getting kind of a spiral. As you add more and more coax, you're getting more and more loss. Instead of following the circle, you're gonna kind of follow a spiral and ultimately wind all the way up at the center if you had a really long piece of lossy coax. But uh, let's, just, let's assume lossless transmission line, adding and removing transmission line will just literally rotate you around this constant SWR circle. 
So what's that also telling you is that ideally adding or removing feed line does not change your SWR. And you might say, well, I know if I change my coax length, my SWR does change. Well, that, can, that will happen when the coax itself is part of the antenna system. So for example, if the shield of the coax is part of your counterpoise system, either intentionally or not intentionally, then you're going to, then you're going to change the feed point impedance of the antenna by adding or subtracting coax, which is also going to affect things. But in those situations where your coax is not a radiating part of your antenna, ideally you're not changing SWR by adding or removing feed line. But you might also say, well, I've got, I've got an automatic antenna tuner in my rig and you know, it doesn't like tuning on 75 meters, but if I add five feet of coax, it does tune it fine. So it must change the SWR, right? It's going from one SWR that it doesn't like and it's going to a different SWR that it can tune to. The reality is it's not changing the SWR, it's cha just changing the particular complex impedance that's being presented and that your tuner might have a hard time matching an impedance that's here, but might not have a hard time matching an impedance that's here, but it's still the same SWR. Okay, so all these interesting little facts kind of come out when you start studying transmission lines and uh, feed line lengths. So what's interesting also is that one complete trip around this circle is essentially a half wavelength of transmission line length. So what that kind of implies is, is that if I have, if I have a transmission line length between my antenna and, um, and my transmitter, and it's exactly a half wavelength long, what that means is the impedance looking into the transmission line length is gonna be exactly equal to the impedance of the antenna feed point. If it's not a half wavelength long, then the impedance looking into the coax isn't gonna be the same as the impedance looking into the antenna itself although the SWR will be the same. So every time you go a half a wavelength, you repeat the impedance. So again, that's, that's, the, that's one of the magic things with a half wavelength line. But now what's interesting is halfway around the, uh, is a quarter wavelength line. And there's a lot of magic things that happen with a quarter wavelength line. You'll hear you know, quarter wavelength trans, uh, tuning stubs and things like that. But what the half, quarter wavelength line does is an open, will be transformed into a short, and a short will be transformed into an open. Okay, so if I took, if I put a little T in my coax line, and I put, a, and I, and I just hung a piece of coax off of the end of that T, and I left the end of it open, right? Didn't put anything on the other end of it. At a frequency where that's a quarter wavelength long, that will look like a dead short. So it could be a pretty effective notch filter for that one, for, for that one frequency. So, um, so really, so pretty interesting. You can actually have an open-ended transmission line that, at a particular frequency, will look like a short. Now, this again repeats every quarter wavelength, right? So, at one quarter wavelength, it'll do this transformation. Another quarter wavelength, you're back to repeating the impedance. Go a quarter wavelength around again, and it goes back and inverts. Quarter wavelength around again, and it repeat and it repeats. So, the odd quarter wavelengths do this transformation. The even quarter wavelengths do the repeats of the impedance. So again, all this is kind of shown on the Smith chart. It's kind of cool stuff. So let's take a look at uh, adding coax lengths in an actual practical measured thing I did with my nano VNA. So I've got the same 20 meter antenna that I'm measuring with just gradually increasing the line length by certain amounts. So here's my starting point. That's kind of the plot that I showed you earlier. So there's my complex impedance, okay, going from 13.7 megahertz up to 14.7 megahertz. Here's my SWR curve. So now, now remember what we said, that we're just gonna rotate around the center of the curve, but uh, rotate around on that, that constant SWR circle. So what that means is that essentially every point on this curve is gonna rotate it around its own circle around the center. Okay, so this, this point right here in the center, that's gonna rotate it on its own little circle right here. The 13.7 point is gonna rotate on a much bigger circle, okay? So, so there's my starting point. So here I added about three feet of coax. So you can see my curve, the whole thing kind of rotated around. Now it didn't go, it didn't maintain its shape perfectly. And the reason for that is because 
the length of the coax is effectively longer at, at 14.7 megahertz than it is at 13.7 megahertz, right? Because at, at 14.7, 14 that's a shorter wavelength. So the length of the coax in wavelengths or fractional wavelengths is actually longer for the higher frequencies. So that this point actually rotates around a little bit further than this point rotates around. So not only is this whole curve rotating around clockwise around the center, it's also kind of compressing a little bit, okay, as it goes around. So that was adding three feet of coax. There's another three feet of coax. I took that curve and rotated it around a little bit more. And another three feet of coax and I rotated it around a little bit more. Now you'll notice the, the curve is a little bit tighter here now. It's like closing up a little bit more than it is over here. And again, that's because this nine feet of coax that I added is more of a fractional wavelength at 14.7 megahertz than it is at 13.7. But now here's the really important thing. No change in SWR. Look at my SWR curve in all these cases. There's my white SWR curve with the minimum SWR right here. There's my SWR curve. There's the SWR curve. And there it is again. It didn't change in changing and adding these different lengths in coax. And the minimum SWR is still at the same point in every one of those, right? Because all these points just rotated around the center. But pretty cool stuff. It's not that maybe I didn't realize that is happening, but this is what's going on when you're adding and subtracting coax length. You're changing the complex impedance, but you're not changing the SWR. So what can we do with that? So, well, what, one thing that's interesting is you can say, well, okay, I know I've measured at my antenna, or excuse me, at my transmit end here, here in the shack, this is the complex impedance I measured here. Now, if I know um, the transmission line length between my transmitter and my antenna, I can essentially measure the impedance at uh, the transmit end and then figure out what the impedance is at the antenna, okay? So if we expand on this portion of the Smith chart, we can actually see that these outer axes, like with the numbers out here, are calibrated in wavelengths towards the generator and wavelengths towards the load. So remember how I said half a wavelength around is, is, is a complete trip around. So we're starting at zero and rotating up. So there's 0 0.04 there. If we go all the way around, Here's 0.49, and guess what? 0.5 would be right there, right? And same thing coming around the other way. There's my 0.04, I go all the way around. Here's 0 0.48, 0 0.49, and back. So we're using those, those scales when we rotate around. So again, I can measure the impedance at the transmitter and predict the impedance at the antenna. So if I measured the impedance here, I would rotate, you know, at the transmit end, I would rotate towards the load, right? by if I know the length of my line, I can say, okay, I'm, my line is this long, okay? And I'll just go by the right, the right fractional uh, wavelengths and say, that's the impedance at the antenna itself. And that might be handy because you, you know, ideally we want the antenna itself to represent a nice resident, to match the transmission line, line impedance. So we really want our matching circuit to be at the, at the antenna end. So, but you can do that by measuring the impedance at the transmit end. And if you know the line length, you'll know what the impedance is at the transmit, uh, the, excuse me, at the antenna, okay? So you can use that to maybe design a matching network. So I wanna talk a little bit about resonance and minimum SWR, because uh, it's another myth that I wanna kind of dispel here a little bit. And as I mentioned kind of towards the beginning that resonance only, the definition of resonance is that only means that the reactance of the complex impedance is zero, okay? It doesn't mean that's where your minimum SWR is. So I, I, did, I didn't cut crop this picture right, but this is actually the center of the Smith chart. You can kind of see these, these circles, the constant resistance circles kind of going through there. So there's my center of the Smith chart, okay? So this point right here is my 50 ohm point that I'm kind of pointing to. So if we take a look at that, you know, I got the marker you know, at the point that's closest to that. But now how many resonant frequencies are there on this curve, right? There's one right there, and there's another one right there. So I actually have two, this, now if you wanna think about it, this antenna and its coax is resonant at two frequencies, but neither of those are where the minimum SWR is. 
So the minimum SWR does not always occur and oftentimes does not occur at the resonant point. So we're all kind of so accustomed to saying, hey, let, let me tune my antenna so it's resonant. And what we're really doing is tuning for a minimum SWR, not, not necessarily tuning for resonance, right? Resonance doesn't mean minimum SWR and they don't always coincide. Uh, but they're, they're, usually, they're usually reasonably close, but uh, they don't have to be. Because uh, generally, the closer and closer you get to your ideal, you know, 50 ohm resistive point, the smaller the reactive component is going to be. But it isn't. It isn't always going to be zero. So, how do we set up the nano VNA to measure an antenna or an antenna system, meaning the antenna and its feed line? Uh, normally, what that means is you're going to select the traces you want to look at, and you might just choose to put the SWR trace up, right? This like the white trace right here, and not have the others. Um, I like using the SWR trace because this is what you know we kind of grew up you know, using for the last 40 or 50 years. I also like putting up the log magnitude on the nano VNA. They just call it log mag, but it's really the log magnitude measured on channel zero, which is the S11. We could do S parameters, a whole nother talk on that, but it's really just the reflection coefficient. So it's the log magnitude of the reflection coefficient. So that's the yellow trace. That's this one right here. And I like having that up there because the SWR curve can tend to be a little bit shallow. Okay, whereas the log magnitude is a bit more sensitive because of the way it's computed, that more clearly shows you right where that minimum point is. Okay, it's a lot easier to see that minimum point is here. And sometimes the SWR is a little bit shallow. So the, uh, the log magnitude of, uh, of S11 can give you sometimes a clearer point of where your minimum SWR is. And then I like also having the Smith chart up here as well. Okay, and for reasons that we'll see in a moment. So you would set up the nano VNA to turn on the traces that you want. In this case, they're all measurements on channel zero and they're just different. One is complex impedance, one's log mag of S11 and one is SWR. And I turn the, the fourth trace off. So turn your traces on, configure them the way you want. Then you go and you set your stimulus range. And I mentioned you don't want to set the stimulus range too wide because the, the, the any VNA has got a limited number of points that it will do. Kind of out of the box, most of the nano VNAs were 101 points. Later firmware updates brought them higher than that. I've got one that'll do 401 points. There's some out there that'll do 601 points. And that's actually the actual points where the calibration is done. Okay. And in between those, it has to do essentially an approximation or a, a, an interpolation between those calibrated points. So you, you don't really want to calibrate over the entire HF band if you're trying to measure an antenna on one particular band. You certainly can, but then it might make sense to have, and the, these nano VNAs allow you to save multiple calibration slots. So you might have one that's set up wide band and then one, then others that are set up just for the bands that you're, uh, you're typically interested in. So you set your traces, set your stimulus range, run your calibration. Okay, again, the calibration sets up the measurement plane. Uh, I've got some videos on this, and this again, it's another topic we can go into, but we'll just talk about you just it's just a good idea to calibrate where your transmitter connects. So you're gonna so the nano VNA is going to see what your what your transmitter sees, and then go make your measurements. So I'm I'm gonna play a video here. This is about uh, six minutes long. And it's a it's a most of video number three fourteen. It's going to show you those steps that I just outlined, and also then show you how you can use the nano VNA when you're adjusting your manual tuner. So uh, sit back and and watch this, and then we'll come back and talk some more. You can see that the yellow trace is already set up to be the log mag of the reflection coefficient, so we'll leave that. The green trace is already a Smith chart, so we'll leave that one alone. So we'll reconfigure the blue trace to be SWR and then get rid of uh, the purple trace. So we bring up the menu, go to display, go to trace, and let's first just get rid of purple trace by touching on it, touching on it again to, to get rid of it. And then we'll select trace number one. The inverse text tells us this we're selected. We'll go back and then tell it to be on channel zero, which is the reflection, the reflection channel or the S11 channel and now we just have to go back in one more time to the format and hit SWR. Next let's set up the frequency range we want to test. So we'll bring our menu back up and go back and back again and go to stimulus. 
In our case, I want to measure the 40 meter amateur radio band from 7 MHz to 7.3. So I touch on the start frequency and I dial in 7 M for megahertz. That will set up the start frequency. And then we'll go back in and select the stop frequency, uh, 7.3 megahertz. And now we've set up the stimulus range that we want to test. The next thing we want to do is run the calibration. So we br go bring the menu back up, go back and hit Cal, and go to Reset to reset the existing calibration. We can see that those calibration indicators have gone away over here. And then we hit Calibrate. And since we're only doing a reflection measurement uh, on channel 0, we only have to do an open, short, and load. So we start off by putting the open on the port and touching open. And next we put a short on the port and touch short. And then we replace the short with a 50 ohm load on the port and touch load. Once we've done all three standards, we can hit Done, and then choose to save it to a memory location. I'm going to choose just to save it to location 1. And so now we hook up uh, the antenna. With the antenna hooked up, we can see our SWR plot over the 40 meter band. We can see the log magnitude of the reflection coefficient, and we can see the Smith chart. And uh, we can use the jog wheel to move our cursor, or marker, to make measurements at, any, at various frequencies across the range, or we even have some marker functions to search for a min or a max. So for example, if I touch on, on marker number one, that activates uh, trace number one, and I can go into the marker function and do a search and search for a minimum, and that will put the marker right at the minimum. And I can see that's at 7.216 megahertz. Now, of course, that's all we need to do if all we want to do is to sweep the antenna. But if we want to retune it, for example, we can leave these displays up and actually watch the reaction as we adjust the tuning on the antenna. So let's say, for example, I want to retune to be closer to the middle of the CW portion of the band instead of in the phone portion where it is now. So we can actually just watch the reaction on the VNA as I tune uh, the controls on my antenna tuner. And this is where I find it handy to have the Smith chart shown on the VNA because uh, you can actually see how the controls on the antenna tuner are going to twist and roll the uh, trace on the Smith chart. And it gives you a little bit better intuitive feel about which way to tune the various controls. Now the first thing I'm going to do is move uh, my marker down to, oh, somewhere in the CW portion of the band, you know, maybe around 7.07, 7.06, 7.05, something in the neighborhood. So to give me an idea, that's the, the point that I want to now try to optimize with the tuner. All right, we'll start by moving uh, some of the dials around here. Let's take a look at uh, how the, the various curves move around. We can see as I turn my inductor up, I can see the Smith chart's kind of turning around in this direction. And we can actually see I'm bringing my marker on the Smith point, Smith chart, closer and closer to the center of the Smith chart. So I'm getting kind of close, but it's still kind of missing the mark a little bit. So we're probably going to, have to optimize the capacitor here as well. So if we tweak on that a little bit, I can see I'm uh, deepening the null there on the uh, reflection coefficient, and I'm getting pretty close. So you can see with just a little more fine tuning on uh, the controls of the tuner, I've got myself pretty darn good at my desired point right there. SWR is about 1.02. I'm sitting right at the center of the Smith chart. So yeah, so hopefully that was kind of an, you know, it's kind of a fun way to play with the nano VNA and to uh, and to really see what your tuner is actually doing to the complex impedance. So um, yeah, it's just a, kind of a, a neat thing to do. So also kind of get used to what the Smith chart showing you and relate them to SWR and that type of a thing. So the last part of the, the chat here, I was going to talk about uh, designing a, an L network, uh, impedance matching network, and a little bit of extra credit here for those that might be interested. I know this might uh, is a bit more of an advanced topic, but it just, it just I think it's helpful to kind of go through and see you know, this is how the Smith chart was used before we really had, you know, kind of automated tools to you know, do some of our calculations for us uh, to design matching networks. We can kind of do it somewhat graphically. So let's run through that process.
So uh, an impedance matching network, like an L network or a Pi network, is really just adding series and parallel inductors and capacitors to essentially move the impedance around to make it look like our desired impedance, in this case, our system impedance or 50 ohms, okay? So an L network is the simplest network to use, um, and its topology, uh, which topology to use, is going to depend a bit on what the load impedance is. And uh, there's, there's these kind of yin-yang diagrams, if you will, that will kind of indicate what the most appropriate um, configuration of the L network is. You know, I've got an L network tuner here. I've got a, you know, my Tentec 238 uh, tuner is an L network tuner, and it can switch between two different networks uh, depending on uh, whether the impedance is high or low. But if your impedance is somewhere in this kind of clear area here, then this network will work. We take our, here's my complex impedance, a shunt capacitor followed by a series inductor. We can match anything in this area down to our down to where we want it to be. And conversely, you know, this one here is a shunt inductor and a series capacitor. And then these, the, these two, um, again, a little bit different, um, show the other networks here as well. And then there's also this other subset here where you got two capacitors or two inductors. You can actually make an L network with two of those. And there's a limited set of complex impedances that they can match. And you'll find oftentimes that um, more than one topology will work, okay? So if my complex impedance was somewhere over here, I could use this topology or this topology, right? Because both of those are in that white area. So why would I choose one or the other? Um, it might be due to, you know, what components you have on hand, right? The value of the inductor and capacitor used in this network will be different than this one. And you might have, you know, one on hand and not the other, for example. Or you might want your matching network to, you know, be a high pass or low pass filter, right? So in this case, this, this matching network is more of a, a low pass filter. It will filter away uh, high order harmonics. So that might actually be a good thing, okay? Because it's gonna filter uh, harmonics away. If you want your matching network to be a high pass filter, you might choose this, okay? So there's a number of considerations that you might choose to pick which topology. You know, because in many cases you have a choice of at least two. Okay, so what happens when we add, you know, these inductors and capacitors? What happens to the impedance? How do we move it around, right? Because the idea is we've got an impedance that's non-ideal, it's not resonant, it's not at 50 ohms, but we want to move it to here. How do we get there? Okay, and we talked about adding elements in series in parallel. So when we add uh, these components, we're going to move the impedance around on the chart. Okay, adding series inductors or series capacitors, meaning a, a, an inductor or capacitor in series with your load is going to move us along the constant resistance circles like this. So if we add a series inductor, it moves us kind of this way clockwise along those constant resistance circles and, and uh, by an amount that you can kind of compute here. So here I went from a, inductive reactants, you know, re normalized reactants of 0.8 to 1.4, which means I moved a normalized reactants value of uh, 0.6 ohms inductive, okay? Multiply that by 50, that tells us how much inductive reactants I need to add, right? Um, going, adding a series capacitor moves us in the other direction along the constant resistance circles, okay? Clockwise and counterclockwise, okay? And we can do the same thing, figure out how far we went. So, but that's all for adding series components. If we're adding components in parallel, uh, we, we usually will do that computation by talking about admittance, right? Admittance is essentially one over impedance, okay? Because when we add things in series, like we add resistors in series, we just, we just add them up, right? R1 plus R2 plus R3 gives us our total, right? But when, we have, when we're adding elements in parallel, we add the inverses of them. So we say one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3 equals one over R total. And then we can invert that to get the total resistance. So those one over you know, resistance or one over complex impedance, we call that admittance, okay? So it's handy to deal with things in admittance when we're adding the parallel elements. So the admittance is really just one over the complex impedance. And just 
considering each component itself, if we just have pure resistance, okay, then one over resistance is something we call conductance. And if we just had a pure reactance, okay, and a pure X, one over that would be the susceptance. So we call that B. But the reality is, is that if we have a complex impedance, it's not as simple as just inverting each element. There is a, it's a bit more complex than that, okay? So converting an impedance in, to admittance is really easy on a Smith chart. Mathematically, it's tricky when you have a complex impedance, but on a Smith chart, it's really easy, okay? So on a Smith chart, there's my complex impedance there. So if I wanna convert that to admittance, I draw my, my constant uh, uh, SWR circle centered around the center. I bisect that circle with a straight line that goes through the center and touches at the other end. And then that value is the complex uh, admittance. So in this case, I've got a one plus J 1.1 right here. And uh, when I invert that, then the uh, admittance is 0.45 minus J 0.5 Siemens. Okay. What's, we talked about the Smith chart and the uh, impedance curves, both the resist, resistance and reactance curves. There are, there's also a way of designing a Smith chart that will show admittance curves. And it really is nothing more than rotating this chart by 180 degrees. Okay, it's just inverting the chart by rotating it around. Uh, so that's kind of what we did you know, on the previous slide, right? We went halfway around that circle. So it's the same kind of a thing. And what I've been showing here all along, but wasn't necessarily so obvious is that this is actually a combination chart. All those red lines, red circles and the red arcs represent the resistance and induct or uh, reactance. But if you look carefully, there's also a set of blue lines in here and they're, they're centered the other way. Those blue lines are all the admittance lines, the conductance and susceptance circles, or conductance circles and susceptance arcs. Okay, constant conductance, constant susceptance. So as you can imagine, uh, when we talked about adding elements in series, we walked, we went, walked our way up and down the constant resistance circles. When we're adding elements in parallel, we're gonna walk up and down the constant conductance circles. Okay, so adding a parallel inductor is walking up uh, the constant conductance circle that way. Again, we're on the blue lines now and adding a parallel capacitor, we're going down the other way. So again, this is really easy to do with the combo Smith chart because uh, those blue lines are there and then we're reading the blue numbers over here to figure out how far we went. So how do we remember which way we go? with all these things. So here's my, my corny little quick tip on how to do this. So when we're adding inductors, whether they're in series or in parallel, we're elevating through the real axis, okay? So if we're adding a series inductor, we're elevating, we're going up through, and we're kind of going in this direction, you know, when it, where we cross the real axis, okay? And then we're adding a parallel inductance, we're again, elevating, you know, through on the constant conductance circles. And even more corny, when we're adding capacitors, we see crashing down through uh, the center axis. So a, a, series a series capacitor is going along the constant resistance circles. A parallel capacitor is going along the constant uh, uh, conductance circles. So now you can kind of see that by adding series and parallel inductors capacitors, we can walk our, our way from any impedance on the chart, walk our way down to, and zigzag our way to the center of the chart to create an impedance match. That's how it, actually how it works. So let's go take a look at the process. So if I'm gonna design an L network, the first thing I'll do is usually draw you know, and highlight my, my R equal one and my G equal one circles. They're gonna help me here in a moment. This is where I wanna to get to right here in the center. Maybe this is where I, my starting point is. Knowing my starting point, I can go to my little yin yang diagrams and figure out what topology I wanna use. So in this case, it's, it's first a series inductor followed by a parallel capacitor. So what we're gonna do is add our series inductor from this point and keep adding that until I hit my constant conductance circle. And depending on where I was, I might do that till I, I'm gonna, I wanna try and hit one of these circles, right? So I'm gonna hit that constant conductance circle. 
Okay, now, now I've got the inductance value that I added. And then I'm gonna add a, in this case, a shunt capacitor. So I'm going down on my constant uh, conductance circles here until I reach the center. And again, reading off the, the, uh, the scales on the blue uh, axes here, I can figure out how much capacitance I added. And there's my, my L and C. So let's do a practical example of it, okay, just by computing this. So here's my practical example. Let's say I'm operating at 432.1 megahertz. I measured my complex impedance of 75 ohms minus with a capacitive reactance of 60 ohms. I normalize that, plot that on the Smith chart. Okay, that's where I am. So that's where my complex impedance is. This is where I want to get to. I'll look at my yin yang and say, okay, I'm going to use this topology. So I'm going to start off with, you know, going from my load, I'm going to start with a shunt inductor and then a series capacitor. So let's go to the next step. So I'll, I'll first kind of again highlight my R equal one circle. And I'm going to, now I'm, going to, I'm adding a shunt inductor. So that means I'm going along my constant conductance circles. Okay, like this blue line right here. And I'm gonna follow that all the way up until I hit my, my R equal one circle. Now I gotta go take a look at how far I moved. So if we look down here, if we follow this down, that's between 0.3 and 0.4. So it's about a 0.32. And so that moved from there to zero. And then from there up to this point here, which is on the 0.5 line. So I basically moved a normalized susceptance of 0.82 Siemens, all right? So that's how far I moved. So that's how far I went. I can invert that to get to the complex, the, the normalized inductance of 1.22. I multiply by 50. So this tells me that I want, I want to add 61 ohms of inductive reactance. And knowing my operating frequency, I can then take, that's the reactance I want, 61 ohms, divided by two pi times that 432.1 megahertz. It tells me my inductor is 22.5 nanohenries. Okay, so that got me up to this point. Step three now, is I want to add my series capacitor. That's going to rotate me down along my, my constant resistance circle to the center. So I rotate that down. I can see that I, I added 1.2 ohms or 1.2 normalized ohms of capacitive reactants. Multiply that by 50. Again, that gave me 60 ohms of capacitive reactants. And again, knowing my operating frequency, I can compute the capacitance value uh, from that. 6.14 picofarads. So now I've got my L matching network that took my complex impedance from my antenna and now transformed it to look like a 50 ohm resistive input impedance. So that's how you design a, an L, -na L matching network using Smith charts. I know it's a lot easier to plug numbers into a calculator and just get it or a simulator or something like that, but this is the way it was done graphically before we had those tools available to us. And it's just kind of cool to see how it all works. So I've got a number of videos on my channel that are related to nano VNAs uh, in terms of the basics and things like that. I've got you know, number 312 is the basics of what a VNA is, what's a VNA itself, uh, and then talks a bit more about the nano VNA. I've got a whole video dedicated to and talking about why, how and why we do a VNA user calibration. Uh, another one, 314 is the one that I kind of showed you is measuring an antenna, uh, observing that tuning process. Uh, 316, you know, how do we measure antenna coax length with the VNA? Number 325 talks about the effect of adding transmission line length. That's what the one where I got those pictures that I showed you where we added three feet at a time. Uh, number 326 is how to measure the impedance of an unknown hunk of coax. And then also there's another one, 334 is showing how to tune a dupl like a repeater duplexer with a nano VNA. So, but it's just a couple of examples of VNA videos that I've got available. So in summary, you know, Smith chart is a pretty highly useful tool for looking at SWR, looking at return loss, you know, doing transmission line impedance transformations, understanding the effect of adding or subtracting transmission lines, maybe designing matching networks and things like that. And there's a whole lot more that you can actually do with it, but this was just kind of what we, we touched on here today. Thanks again for watching this presentation. I know the folks at the San Fernando Valley Amateur Radio Club uh, enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. Thanks again, as always, for watching, and we'll see you again next time.